Tonight, I want to tell you about a protein complex that I think is truly amazing, even miraculous, called the nuclear pore complex. It's well known to evolutionary biologists, although it's still pr pretty poorly understood. But should you care? Well, your body has about 40 quadrillion of them. That's a 40 followed by 15 zeros, and they are essential to your existence. They enable your body to live, as we will see. The June 10th, 2022 issue of the journal Science, which the cover is shown here on this slide, <clears throat> published a special section on new research providing information on the architecture of this structure. And my intent is to tell you a bit more about the nuclear pore complex, show you some more pictures, and provide some information on the R&D reported in this, in this issue of Science. Most evolutionary biologists believe that the nuclear pore complex evolved into its present form via natural selection through common descent from an ancestor in the distant past. And you know, while I can't disprove their theory, I will be presenting some difficulties <clears throat> that, that that argument faces. An alternative argument which makes more sense to me is called common design. And I'll explain this as we go along. Although I will be questioning some of the statements and findings in these articles, I want to point out that the science in them is truly amazing, and I have the highest respect for the men and women who did the research and wrote these articles. First, a little basic science. <clears throat> the nuclear pore complex only appears in organisms with a nucleus, namely eukaryotes. That means all animals, plants, insects, funguses, algae, and even some single-celled organisms called protists, and yeast. So what doesn't have a nuclear pore complex? The answer is bacteria and archaea, and a little later I'll explain why. <laughs> this diagram is known as the hierarchy of life. <clears throat> I've listed the complete scientific classification of two eukaryotes here, because these are two of the organisms that were reported on in the June, June issue of Science. <clears throat> and we will concentrate tonight <clears throat> on these two organisms. Before we get into that, though, I do want to point out that this is actually the tree of life, the famous tree of life that Darwin put into his uh, book, uh, Origin of Species, in 1859. But instead of being a normal tree of life, it's inverted so that you, if you turn this upside down, you would have basically the tree of life with the branches spreading out at the top, uh, where Homo sapiens, us, and uh, the fungus that is on the right would be. <clears throat> <clears throat> so on the left of this diagram, and I'm not gonna invert it for you, is us, that is humans, uh, or more properly from the bottom up, the species, Homo sapiens, the genus, Homo, the family, Hominidae, order primates, class Mammalia, phylum Chordata, and kingdom Animalia. The other organism on the right is a fungus, Chitomium thermophylum. Uh, you don't have to pronounce that. There will not be a quiz at the end of this session. This fungus grows on dung or compost at temperatures ranging from about 120 to 140 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, we humans have a nuclear pore complex, but even the lowly fungus, Chitomium thermophylum, also has a nuclear pore complex, which is actually quite similar to our own. I won't even try to pronounce the hierarchy of Chiton Chitomium thermophylum. I'm having enough trouble pronouncing it, but you can see uh, the way it goes. And way near the top of the diagram is the at the domain level, besides eukaryotes, there are two other domains, bacteria and archaea, which are prokaryotes. But neither of them has a membrane-bound nucle nucleus, so they don't have a nuclear pore complex. The evolutionary paradigm holds that all living organisms descended from a single organism here at the top of the tree, which is actually be the roots, if you turn it upside down. <clears throat> and uh, so we're all related to each other in theory. And this is this is called 
the theory of common descent. This picture shows a typical eukaryotic cell. The nucleus of this cell is the purple structure in the top middle of the <clears throat> picture that looks like it has about a quarter of it cut away so we can see inside. Please notice the little yellow daisy shaped structures labeled nuclear pore. Embedded in each pore is the nuclear pore complex, a very large and complex protein structure the, uh, comprised of many com uh, proteins, not just one, but uh, as many as a thousand. The main function of the nucleus is to contain the, ce the cell's DNA and to protect it, of course. <clears throat> the two most important functions of the DNA which occur in the nucleus are called replication and transcription. Replication is simply the process of the DNA strand duplicating itself as the cell prepares to split into two identical cells, either as part of the growth process or as the cell reaches the end of its life and builds a replacement of itself. Transcription is the process in which a section of the DNA called a gene is copied into a strand of RNA which must exit the nucleus where it becomes part of the process in which proteins are made. The details of how this is done are important, but not, not actually important to this presentation. The important things to remember are that strands of RNA must leave the nucleus to build proteins and multiple different proteins must enter the nucleus where they are essential for the replication and transcription process. <clears throat> This is where the nuclear pore complexes come in. The RNA leaving the nucleus and the proteins entering the nucleus must do so via the nuclear pore complexes. Again, the details are not important to this lecture. The sizes of these RNA strands and protein molecules differ widely, yet all must pass through the nuclear pore complexes, and only very specific RNA strands and protein molecules are permitted in or out. Exactly how this specificity is achieved is somewhat of a mystery, although I'll explain in a bit what we do know. Based on the most recent research, it appears that the nuclear pore complexes also perform other important functions, which I'll also mention shortly. Here's a close-up of the nucleus showing a cross-section of the nuclear envelope consisting of the inner and outer nuclear membranes. Again, the nuclear pore complexes, or NPCs, are the little yellow daisy-shaped structures on the surface of the nucleus, with several nuclear pore complexes shown in cross-section. Each NPC is an aggregate of proteins embedded in a hole, or pore, in the nuclear envelope. Scientists have given these proteins a special name. They are known as nucleoporins, and they're abbreviated as NUPs. I'll, I'll try to remind you of this uh, once in a while, but I would tend to fail safe to the word NUPS, meaning uh, nucleoporins, or the, the, that is the sum total of all of the proteins in each, nu uh, in each nuclear pore. Here's some interesting facts about the human nuclear pore complex. Humans have about 40 trillion cells. <clears throat> each cell has a single nucleus having about 1,000 nuclear pore complexes, or NPCs. <clears throat> Thus, your body has about 40 quadrillion of these nuclear pore complexes. Each nuclear pore complex contains about 1,000 protein subunits, or NUPs, with each NUP being a separate chain of amino acids. There are about 34 different protein NUPs in each NPC, meaning there are many copies of each NUP. NPCs are one of the largest known protein complexes. Finally, <clears throat> finally, there are about a thousand transfers of molecules in or out of each nucleus per second. In other words, these complexes are quite busy and we could not exist without them. Here's an artist's rendering of a cross-section of one of the pores <clears throat> showing some of the proteins or nuclear porins lining the pore. And this is a picture that was taken from that science journal in June of last year. As you'll see in some of the later pictures I'll show, there are lots more nucleoporins in the nuclear pore complex, which are not shown in this picture, 
because they would make the picture even harder to understand than it is. The top of the drawing is in the cytoplasm that is outside, uh, or I should say inside the cell, yeah, inside the cell, but outside the nucleus. The bottom is the interior of the nucleus. The two U-shaped structures on the sides pointing at each other, the U is pointing at each other on each end, show that the <clears throat> inner and outer membranes somehow grow together at each pore. I haven't been able to find an explanation of how that happens, but I suspect it's controlled by another part of the nuclear pore complex not shown in this picture, called the luminal ring. We'll, we'll see more of it in a moment. The luminal ring <clears throat> encircles the pore from within the nuclear envelope. I think it's likely that the luminal ring is responsible for causing the inner and outer membranes to grow together at each pore. The pore size is very large in terms of molecular size, which is good because many of the proteins needed are quite large and they must be transported into the nucleus through these pores. The RNA needed to make all the proteins the body needs must be transported out of the nucleus. But at the same time, the apparatus to do this needs to be very selective so as not to transport the wrong molecules either into or out of the nucleus. Well, just to clarify, prokaryotes, meaning all bacteria and archaea, like the one I'm showing here, don't have a nucleus. They have this thing called a nucle nucleoid. I think it's sometimes called a nucleolus. <clears throat> and this will become important later in the presentation when we discuss when the first nuclear pore complexes were created, which would have been when the first eukaryotes were created or soon after. I use the word created advisedly, since evolutionary biologists would tell us that these NPCs evolved through common descent rather than being created. In the interest of letting you decide for yourself whether the best evidence we have supports common descent or common design by a designer for the NPCs, I'll try to present the best evolutionary evidence I've found, along with the best evidence I can find, supporting my belief that NPCs were designed by an intelligent agent, I believe, the God of the Bible. So here's a more complex picture of a cross-section of a part of the human nuclear pore complex. Even this one doesn't have everything in it. But here we are looking mostly at the cytoplasmic side of the NPC, that is the part outside the nucleus. At the top of the picture are those frond-like structures called the cytoplasmic filaments. When I first saw this, this kind of reminded me of a cathedral. It looks to me like these structures are, are the poles in the cathedral. So I see design in this thing all the way down. <clears throat> <clears throat> the cytoplasmic filaments, or CF, are attached to the cytoplasmic ring. That's the next thing down, which is attached to the inner ring, which lines the inside of the pore itself. And below that, you can just see the nucleoplasmic ring, which is entirely inside the nucleus. It, too, is attached to the nuclear ring. Inside the nuclear envelope and surrounding the nuclear pore is the luminal ring. That's kind of next to the bottom here. <clears throat> and attached to the nucleoplasmic ring is the nuclear basket, which is not shown in this picture. There are eight identical cytoplasmic filaments and eight identical nuclear basket elements and each of the ring structures consists of eight identical structures of NUPS arranged in an octagonal shape. Okay, make, this may be a little simpler. This is a cartoon giving you another more simplified view. Once again, the cytoplasmic filaments are attached to the cytoplasmic ring, which is attached to the inner ring, lining the inside of the pore itself, Below that is the nucleoplasmic ring, which is inside the nucleus, and attached to the nucleoplasmic ring at the bottom is the nuclear basket, which I did not show in the previous diagram. Note the section in the middle of the diagram <clears throat> marked diffusion barrier, parenthesis FG repeats. We'll have more to say about this a little later. 
the luminal ring may be indicated by the structure outlined at the U-shaped structure of the inner and outer membranes, supporting my thought that it is the luminal ring that causes the inner and outer membranes to fuse together. Okay, here's where I get a little bit uh, <clears throat> playful with you. Let's compare the human cell nucleus with a factory and imagine that each factory or nucleus has 1,000 shipping or receiving docks, each consisting of 1,000 processing pieces, some of which might be people or machines or just structures, and 1,000 units are shipped out of, of, out of, or received into each dock every second. Now imagine a company with a huge number of such factories. That company is your body. Whenever I think of factories, I'm reminded of one of my ch favorite childhood books, The Bear That Wasn't, and the marvelous pictures in it like these two of the factory that the bear finds himself in. Briefly, <clears throat> a bear hibernates one winter and he wakes up the next spring to find himself inside a factory that was built during the winter. The rest of the story is how the factory management team spot, spots him and tries to convince him that he's just a silly man who needs a shave and wears a fur coat, who is pretending to be a bear. So they insist that he go back to work as he does in his picture on the right. These managers, he, pretty smart bear, these managers remind me of evolutionary biologists who insist that these factories are the outcome of blind, unguided evolutionary processes. But there are some major differences between the shipping and receiving docks of ordinary factories and nuclear pore complexes. The nuclear pore complexes are fully automated, operating 24-7, 365 days a year, touchless and with no lights. And malfunctions are rare. If they weren't, our bodies would stop operating. Here's some interesting quotes from some famous scientists who are committed to the evolutionary paradigm. Richard Dawkins says somewhere, natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered, and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of life, has no purpose in mind. Henry G. says, evolution has no plan. It has neither memory nor foresight. And Jerry Coyne, the guy who wrote <clears throat> uh, Why Evolution is True, says that evolution is unguided and purposeless. Most origin of life researchers accept that the first life originated on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago and was almost certainly prokaryotic. In other words, either bacteria or archaea, or perhaps some even simpler predecessor. In any case, there would have been no nuclear envelope surrounding the nucleus, since there wasn't even a nucleus, so no nuclear pores or nuclear pore complexes existed at that, that early time. In 1967, microbiologist Lynn Margulis came up with a theory called symbiogenesis, or endosymbiosis, which would explain how the first eukaryotes came into being somewhere around 2 billion years ago, give or take 500 million years. Okay, this is a, a kind of a model that uh, Lynn Margulis came up with, uh, and I'll take it from left to right. Uh, so just bear with me as I walk you through it. <clears throat> This assumes that the ancestral prokaryotic organism experienced an infolding of its plasma membrane, which eventually formed a nuclear membrane, thus actually forming a nucleus, uh, and an endoplasmic reticulum, which is the structure that begins to be replaced uh, placed in, in, in this third picture from the left. <clears throat> then in the fourth step, an aerobic heterotrophic prokaryote was engulfed or swallowed by the first organism and managed to multiply before it was digested. <clears throat> the one shown here eventually became the mitochondrian organelle, organelle common to so many eukaryotes and shown in the fifth picture now. <clears throat> Another 
in addition to the mitochondria, also engulfed a photosynth photosynthetic prokaryote, the little green uh, bean-looking structures, <clears throat> which eventually became the plastid, which is also known as the chloroplast. <clears throat> then the organism survived <clears throat> by developing a symbiotic relationship <clears throat> between the mitochondria structure and the plastids and the outer st structure itself. <clears throat> <clears throat> so in that end endosymbiotic process, the swallower provided a safe environment because of a robust outer membrane or cell wall, and the swallowed ones provided a useful function, such as being able to more efficiently convert food into usable energy. And over the years since 1967, this theory has become the accepted orthodoxy of most evolutionary biologists, despite the fact that there are a number of serious questions which arise. The most obvious one, perhaps, is how did the swallower not digest its prey immediately? End of story. A key assumption of symbiogenesis shown in this diagram has been that the eukaryotic my mitochondria, which provides the main energy source for most eukaryotes, including all plants and animals, originated as a bacteria engulfed by a larger organism, probably an archaea, long ago. And supporting this theory is the fact that mitochondria actually do have a small nuclear component containing about 16,000 DNA nucleotides. That's, of course, in comparison with the 3.2 billion nucleotides that our human structures support. Besides the problem of explaining how the first successful engulfing relationship didn't end up in the swallowed one being digested, another major problem is how the swallower developed a nuclear envelope consisting of a double membrane around its nucleus, since no prokaryotes existing today have a membrane enclosed nucleus. Well, this diagram shows a proposed answer to that, but I question whether or not it makes sense. Obviously, since all eukaryotes have a nucleus surrounded by a nuclear envelope, this would have been an early requirement. And next, since there must be a way for RNA to escape the nucleus and proteins to enter, something like nuclear pores and a nuclear pore complex were necessary essentially immediately. Unfortunately, no fossils this old uh, exist, helping us to un unravel the difficulties with symbiogenesis. For probably at least one billion years after the creation or evolution of the first eukaryotic cell, all eukaryotes were single-celled. As I've said, it's not clear how or why early eukaryotes developed a nuclear envelope around the nucleus. But once they did, how did RNA escape the nucleus to form proteins in ribosomes? And how did the proteins necessary for replication and transcription get back into the nucleus? And how did the main nucleus begin to produce RNA and proteins for the mitochondria, which were outside the nucleus, allowing the size of the mitochondria genome to shrink to such a small number as 16,000, especially since the genome of the supposed parent species of bacteria has a genome size of over 1 million? I haven't heard good explanations for any of these questions, I think that most explanations amount to arm waving. Today, not only do all eukaryotes <clears throat> have a nuclear envelope and nuclear pore complexes, but all of them are very similar in both function and genetic composition, strongly suggesting common descent to most evolutionary biologists. But let's think about some steps which must have been necessary for the nuclear pore complexes to ev have evolved and what challenges those steps must overcome. So a possible evolutionary step one, as shown in the diagram that I showed earlier, might be the infolding of the outer membrane of a prokaryote to enclose its nucleus. But why, <clears throat> why would this be necessary? Because we have a reason to believe that both in archaea and bacteria, they have existed for 3.8 billion years still they do not have, none of them have a nucleus or a nuclear pore complex. No new, 
no known, known prokaryotes today have a membrane enclosed nucleus. And how would RNA molecules escape the nucleus and proteins enter before there were pores? Possible evolutionary step two might be the embedding of proteins in the membrane to form pores. But how did those proteins come into existence in the first place, knowing where and why they were needed to embed themselves in the nu nucleus? And what preventing undesirable, what has prevented undesirable molecules from entering the nucleus until the right proteins came along to create the nuclear pore complex? Possible evolutionary step three <clears throat> might be the first prokaryote engulfing another. But why didn't that result in the first one digesting the second? Possible evolutionary step four might be evolving of single-celled eukaryotes, such as protists or fungi, to multi-celled fungi, plants, and animals. But the fact that all NPCs from all these organisms are very complex and appear to have evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved <clears throat> suggests that the initial NPCs had to be very complex from the start. How can that be? Maybe a scientist developed new, newer and more sophisticated techniques. The answer to some of these questions may become more evident. <clears throat> Let's now consider some specific nuclear porins I've selected from the articles in the June edition of Science. The researchers in these articles examined the nuclear pore complexes of four different organisms. I want to compare and contrast the nuclear porins to explore the likelihood of common descent to explain these nuclear pore complexes and to make it easier, I will restrict my comparison just, just humans and chitomium thermophilum, which I will just refer to in the future of this presentation as the fungus. The cartoon on the left presents a human NPC and the one on the right, the fungus NPC. Obviously they look a lot alike, <clears throat> But the human genome has 3.1 billion DNA base pairs, whereas the chitomium thermophilum genome has just 28 million, smaller than the human genome by a factor of over 100. Obviously, humans are much more complex than fungi, but it is surprising, I think, that there is so much similarity between their nuclear pore complexes. This would be another argument evolutionary, bio evolutionary biologists use to support the idea of common descent. But instead, I think it's reasonable to think that a good designer would reuse designs which have worked well in the past. Okay, apologies in advance for the busyness of this picture. You're now looking at the identification of the key protein structures in just the cytoplasmic filaments of the human nuclear pore complex at the bottom and the fungus at the top. In the center, under the label, NUP ortholog nomenclature, and which is marked both on the right, is the equivalent nomenclature of each. Thus, the first NUP listed here <clears throat> of the fungus is NUP 82 at the very top of your picture, which is considered to be an ortholog, that is, it performs about the same functions as human NUP 88. You'll notice that in this diagram in the human uh, genome, uh, NUP 358 is actually on the top, and NUP 88 is the second one. But remember that um, the uh, uh, evolutionary biologists think that NUP 88 for humans and NUP 82 for fungi were orthologs of each other, meaning that they basically have a lot in common. So let's start with fungus NUP 82 at the top, for which we see that the human ortholog, as I mentioned before, is NUP 88. We see that NUP82 has 882 amino acids, the little numbers at the underneath and to the right of uh, the NUP82 is 882, if you can't read it, <clears throat> 595 of which are called beta propeller, and about 120 of which are called coiled core. Don't worry about these names, they just describe the approximate shape of the NUP. Looking at the bottom picture, we see that human NUP88 consists of 741 amino acids, of which the first 493 are identified as beta propeller, followed by some unstructured amino acids, followed by number 559 to 741, or 182 amino acids, 
identified as coiled coal, coiled coil. Exactly what they do is not important for us at this point. But according to the authors of one of the June papers, there is a quote unquote conserved modular architecture between these two species reflected in these cytoplasmic filament ducts, especially the ortholog, orthologs between the fungus and the human. This basically means the authors believe the similarities between these structures mean that they are the products of common descent. Comparing all the orthologs, we see there are no identical matches of amino acids, with the biggest difference being the existence of human NUP358, which contains 3,224 amino acids, for which there is no fungus ortholog. Also, the authors point out there are significant differences between the way the human and fungus cytoplasmic filament NUP complex is anchored to the inner ring assembly, meaning they see no evidence of common descent in these structures. But please notice that NUP358 in the human picture has eight kind of purplish bands from amino acids 1,343 to 1,809, and I've circled that with a yellow oval. And these are identified as zinc fingers, if you look at the, uh, the, at the caption at the bottom. <clears throat> this is very interesting to me because there are no amino acids which contain zinc or any other metals. But it turns out that something like 30% of all proteins contain metals, many of which act as catalysts or enzymes, while others act to transport electrons inside their proteins. It's somewhat of a mystery how the just right metal gets into the gets to the right just right protein to perform the necessary just right functions that these so-called metalloprotein proteins perform. Here's a quote from a 2017 textbook which addresses a question I've had for many years, which is how is it that metals appear in many proteins even though the chemical formulas for proteins don't include any metals? Uh, let me say that again. How is it that metals appear in many proteins, even though the chemical formulas for proteins don't include any metals? This quote here was obviously written from an evolutionary perspective and not from a design perspective, but please notice that it doesn't answer my question, though I believe it strongly implies design. And this is taken from the book Metalloprotein Active, Asite, Active Site Assembly. And the authors say, early, quote, early characterization of function and structure of metalloenzymes inevitably led to studies of their origin through cellular interaction with environmental metals and the evolution of assembly pathways to incorporate metals as active sites in metalloproteins. These pathways can be quite complex, given that simply admitting free metal ions to the cellular environment to find their metalloprotein homes can be detrimental to cellular machinery that is toxic. Thus, these assembly mechanisms are intimately tied to mechanisms to control the cell's metal port portfolio. They call it homostasis, homostasis, homeostasis, excuse me, and both comprise the exquisite result of orga organic life taking advantage of the inorganic environment while protecting itself from toxic consequences. Again, let's look at human NUP358, amino acids number 1,343 to 1,809, labeled ZNFS, which stands for zinc fingers, one through eight. <clears throat> As we saw earlier, NUP358 is a cytoplasmic filament NUP, and there are eight cytoplasmic filaments in each nuclear pore complex. However, each cytoplasmic filament is asso associated with five NUP358 molecules. So there are 40 NUP358 molecules with 320 zinc fingers in each nuclear pore complex. The zinc fingers of NUP358 appear to play a role in the transport of molecules from the cytoplasm, probably including proteins, into the nucleus. Here's a picture of a zinc finger protein. A special chemical bonding called coordination bonding is employed when metals are incorporated in proteins. 
Here we can see that the zinc ion in green is held in place when it bonds two cysteine and two histidine amino acids. The histidines are the ones with ring structures. And from this picture, it is not obvious why they are called zinc fingers. But this picture gives a better perspective, I think. Here we see two zinc fingers pointing upward, the stick diagrams on the left. Recall that each NUP, recall that each NUP 358 has eight zinc, zinc fingers, and note the comment that the most probable DNA binding site chains are indicated by balls. That is, the eight small black balls protruding from each finger are the probable binding sites where the transport process starts. <laughs> Although <clears throat> there are a lot of details concerning the nuclear pore complex which are not yet known, I fully expect that as research techniques get more and more refined, most of these details will become known. I also suspect that that will reveal more and more evidence of design. By the way, although the fungus does not have a NUP358 ortholog, it does contain zinc fingers elsewhere in its nuclear pore complex. And here's the human cytoplasmic filament NUP358 structure once more. Note this time that from amino acid 832 to 1171 is a gray band, which I again, I've got circled in a yellow oval. <clears throat> consisting of FG repeats. F stands for the amino acid phenylalanine and G for glycine. This represents a very long repeating string of these two amino acids. A unique feature of these FG repeats is that unlike most other proteins, these do not fold into three-dimensional structures. And there are many other additional FG repeats in the other NPC structures. <clears throat> Here's the cartoon picture of the nuclear human nuclear pore complex again. Please think of the strings of unstructured Fs and Gs as filling the nuclear pore with obstacles uh, to free passage, or in more technical terms, a passive diffusion barrier. So you see this up at the upper right-hand corner, it says diffusion barrier, FG repeats. That's what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> These are also called intrinsically disordered, pre pro excuse me, intrinsically disordered proteins. And they basically, they act, as far as I can tell, to restrict large molecules from freely getting into and out of the nuclear pore complex. Transport proteins bind to cargo mole molecules and passage through the NPC is apparently controlled by the way these transport proteins interact with the FG repeats. Once again, the fungus also has FG repeats in many of its NUPs, so there's a lot more similarity between the nuclear pore complexes of these two organisms than there are differences. Okay, at this point, I have a short video from one of the June Science papers. It was constructed from a series of still pictures of the nuclear envelope, plus the symmetric cytoplasmic ring, inner ring, and nuclear ring without the cytoplasmic filaments, and the nuclear basket or the luminal ring or the FG repeats. Almost immediately, the nuclear envelope is removed to give a clear view of the nuclear nucleoporins, that is the NUPs. Please notice how the NUPs expand and contract to shrink or expand the nuclear pore opening to accommodate larger or smaller molecules. I think this is a fantastic video. It seems to show how the pore opening adjusts to accommodate different sized molecules and protein assemblies. But if there are 1,000 objects moving into or out of the nuclear pore every second, how is the expansion and contraction controlled? And what mechanism, if any, is used to control the size of the objects? The papers acknowledge the fact that there are still a lot of unanswered questions and, and a lot of work still to do. So let's finish watching the, the uh, video. It's almost over now.
Here are the best arguments I could find in support of the case that the nuclear poor complex resulted from common descent. First, the remarkable resemblance between NPCs of organisms from different kingdoms, such as animals and fungi. Second, <clears throat> general acceptance of the symbiotic hypothesis. Third, general acceptance of the evolutionary paradigm. And fourth, multiple conserved gene sequences between vastly different species, such as fungi and vertebrates. And here are the most important less reasons that I question whether common descent could have produced the nuclear pore complexes we observe today. First, extreme complexity, as well as the appearance of architecture, purpose, and design in the nuclear pore complex. Second, no explanation why the first engulfed prokaryote wasn't digested. Third, no good explanation for how the first nuclear envelope evolved. Fourth, no explanation for how the first nuclear pore complex evolved, even if a nuclear envelope did uh, surround the nucleus in the early ones. But how did the first NPC evolve and the holes in the nucleus get pour punched? Since nuclear pore complexes in all eukaryotes appear very similar, their evolutionary origin must have been very early. And there, I think there's an insufficient evolutionary explanation for civic, significant NPC developments, such as a vertebrate, NUP358, totally different, totally lacking in the fungi genome. Here are some quotes from scientific articles and books written by biologists who support the evolutionary paradigm. I think it's very interesting that these statements contradict the idea that the nuclear pore complex is the product of blind, unguided evolutionary processes. First, <clears throat> from my biology book, Campbell and Reese, the eighth edition of 2009, we see, this is the only statement in that whole book that talks about the nuclear envelope and the nuclear pore complex. And it says, and I quote, the nuclear envelope is a double membrane. The two membranes, each a lipid bilayer with associated proteins, are separated by a space of 20 to 40 nanometers. The envelope is perforated by pore structures that are about 100 nanometers in diameter. At the lip of each pore, the inner and outer membranes are continuous. An intricate protein structure called a pore complex lines each pore and plays an important role in the cell by regulating the entry and exit of most proteins and RNAs, as well as large complexes of macromolecules. And if after reading Campbell and Reese Biology, the eighth edition, you think that maybe there's gonna be something more about the pore complex and the pore, nuclear pores, you're, you'd be wrong. There isn't anything more in this, evident, in, in this uh, issue of the book. Second, <clears throat> one of the June 10th, 22 Science Magazine articles says, Beyond its function as a selective bidirectional channel for macromolecules, the role of the NPC extends to genome organization, transcription regulation, mRNA maturation, and ribosome assembly. And then finally, the words architecture of the dot 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 appear in the title of actually, I think three of the of the articles in the June 10th Science Magazine, but also in the title of many of the recent articles in the scientific literature concerning the nuclear pore complex. Architecture implies design to me. Again, I think of the, the architecture of a cathedral such as Notre Dame, which reminds me of this structure. It's not a term I would expect to see used to describe a blind, unguided process. So in summary, a common descent seems like a convenient way to explain the symbiotic hypothesis and the existence of the many different types of nuclear pore complex, except that there are many problems, which we've spelled out here, which common descent does not explain. Third, evolutionary biologists would argue that common des design implies a god of the gaps argument. But I believe instead that the common descent, the idea of common descent, implies nature of the gaps, since there are so many things that we don't understand yet about it. And frankly, I think that requires a lot of faith on the part of the atheist. 
I close with this quotation from Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And that concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, what um, what age group uh, would be studying this nucleopore? Um, Great this question. High school or college or or what? I I think well, I'd have to say since this uh, biology text that I just quoted, this very short paragraph from, uh, was the uh, initial biology course in a in a uh, well in a in a community college, but. It's a pretty serious biology textbook meant for the uh, freshman or sophomore year at, at college. So uh, this one didn't cover it. So I would say this would be later in uh, in your undergraduate studies or maybe even in your graduate level studies. And I basically you don't find that much about the nuclear pore complex, except every once in a while, you know, there's this marvelous se series of articles in Science magazine last June. But the but the uh, the articles themselves are pretty highfalutin and not something that you would want to pick up and try to uh, sort out through yourself. I mean, unless you were pretty deep into biology. I was just wondering, like, if um, you know, uh, my neighbor who's studying um, biology uh, or going towards like medical school or, right, or right. but is is in college. Um, they probably would have just seen that small part of like, you know, the double membrane and such. And so to be able to maybe start a conversation with them and say, oh, yeah, what do you think about that? Nucleopore? I think I, I think that's, that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I think so. But probably not high school then. Uh, high school kids are pretty smart. I mean, <laughs> OK, yeah, that's so true. I, I don't know. You know, I I. I I try. I'm not going to say that I dumbed this presentation down, but uh, you know, I did not unload on you all of the stuff that they said in the Science Magazine. So I, I did try to make it uh, reachable for those people who don't have a strong science background. I well, don't know I to what extent was, I succeeded, but no, I think that was that was you did a really great job in regards to that. So that thank you, those of us who have that biology background. It's, it's a nice reminder of like how we would be able to explain it to somebody who's just starting to study it or. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, they will know about most, most kids would know about, I think even in high school, at the high school level, they would know that eukaryotes have a nucleus and a, mm -hmm. and the nucleus has a membrane around it, but they wouldn't have given much thought and that they probably have studied enough to know that DNA, well, the, the central dogma of biology, which is that, that, uh, DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA is translated in the ribosome to into proteins. Because this is really just it, that that's on, that's a really basic structure. And in order to do that, you have to get in and out of the nucleus. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's good. That's a good way for us to be able to have that start a conversation. Right. Anybody else? So for the cells that don't have a nucleus, right? Um, what is what is it that, that protects the, the structure of DNA? I'm an engineer, so this is- Yeah, well, it, well, would, it would, I think the, <laughs> Yeah, I think that the answer would be uh, <clears throat> nothing. Well, the, it, would, it would be the cell wall of the bacteria or or the archaea. So it, it, it basically, and remember that, that, that the bacteria and archaea are really small. They're just, you know, they're single cell and they're, they're really tiny. So this basically means that something even smaller is going to have to invade their invade them like a like a virus or an even smaller bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Next. Anybody else? Uh Kirby, I, I have a question. This yeah, is go John. Ahead, John. Yeah. Um, are these uh nuclear pore complexes the only Ins and out means for 
uh, matter to go into a cell and going out of a cell? Well, it's not into and out of the cell. It's into and out of the nucleus. But, okay, into so and no, out the, of a... Oh, no, into and out of the nucleus. Into and out... Into and out... Okay. Oh. oh, I don't know what's happening to... Uh, you're you're, you're just, jumping around. <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna I'm answer not sure the question. what happened. <laughs> I'm gonna, there you are. Now you just settle down. I'm, uh, I'm going to try to answer that question, though. Uh, <clears throat> oh, let me see. So... Actually, it really distracted me when you, when you were jumping around like that. Uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, so the cell itself, uh, each cell itself also has a lot of pores in it where you can get stuff in and into and out of the cell. But talking about the nuclear, the nuclear pore complex and the uh, uh, nuclear envelope around the nucleus, there actually is something, another way for much smaller molecules like protons, for example, or uh, <clears throat> uh, sodium or calcium um, ions to get into and out of the uh, out of the nucleus. And that is, they can just go through the the membrane without having another transport mechanism. So, the, but other than that, if you have larger larger molecules, they pretty much have to go in. Uh, they have to go through the nuclear pore complex. So it's this is basically. RNAs going out of the nucleus and uh, proteins coming back in, as well as yeah. a few other things. That's that's very interesting. I, I find it kind of fascinating because um, my younger brother, uh, Dr. David Yu at Johns Hopkins, did a fundamental research on what, what they call it, calcium channeling uh -huh. through, through the cell membrane. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is uh, even smaller, you know, the cells here, but right. you're talking about a nucleus inside yes. the cell and the nuclear pore complex right. channeling going in there. So he, his work was on the fundamental on the cell membrane, and right. how calcium channeling is fundamental to getting stuff in and out of the cell. So I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. So how do they get to that smaller level? Because you're talking about like, say a, uh, like a 40, uh, oh, Na yeah, that's yeah, like a 100, 100 nanometer uh, open diameter. Well, I mean, core. this is basically, they have been studying, nanometer diameter. they that's have been studying the nuclear pore complexes. Um, and I'm not sure how far back this goes, but I know that it goes back at least to the 1980s. Yeah. And, and okay. so, you know, and, and they have been getting the microscopes have been getting even more and more powerful. You know, and so I think that the video that I showed, which is basically, you know, all these nucleoporins and, you know, breathing in and out. Mm -hmm. Whoa, if this doesn't look like design to, to me, yeah. I mean, it does. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, so 100 nanometers, I, I have approximate idea what that is. Pretty because small. The, the, uh, the latest, the smallest... Um, feature in semiconductor uh, manufacturing for integrated circuit is three nanometers. Okay, that's a printed image uh, engineers can do in manufacturing. They, they were using extreme ultraviolet lithography. They can mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 100 nanometers, which is pretty large compared yeah. to that small dimension. Yes, it is. So you can certainly using um, scanning electron microscope, right. see that feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that leads me to the second part of this question is for a biologist to study that, did they have to take the nucleus out of the cell, put it under the microscope and then uh, do their investigation? You know, a petri dish or what? Well, obviously that would be a problem for a um, uh, for human cells. Uh, except it, it could be a dead human cell. Yeah, that's or true. Something. They, they could take a they could take a dead human cell. Sure, from yeah. a cadaver or something, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually I should be able to answer that question from this series of uh, science articles because they. Okay, uh, and, but I can't I, off the top of my head. I can't remember exactly how they how they did it. But it was I mean, they had a lot of very sophisticated 
uh, techniques that they used. And and I think that the the one where they were actually where they built that video, I think that they were depending on some very sophisticated uh, software. Um, new yeah, it's a computer newly simulation. Yeah, it seems like it's a computer simulation of right. whatever they observed from scanning electron microscope. Right, exactly. And uh, it must be very painstaking. Painstaking. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. it, Thank what, you very another much. thing that, that I find, and this kind of get, gets back to what Belinda was asking about, is that as we learn more and more, scientists become more and more specialized. You know, so here are here are scientists that do nothing but study the uh, nuclear pore complexes. That's their whole reason for being. <laughs> you know, and so I would think it it would tend to make people get kind of narrow in their focus. Well, yeah. Well, they make a living out of it, right? Um, you get grants, you know, from NIH, and right. you can publish a lot of papers, and you can travel to different exotic places and conferences right. to present these papers mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah next, very interesting thank you very much next next question anybody else have a one that they want to bring up if, if no one else has a question i'll i'll ask you a question okay uh, when i was doing the reasons institute we studied like what are some of the characteristics of design um kind of like i think even from an engineering standpoint so uh so we're in in this uh nuclear pore um design mm -hmm. what characteristics point towards uh design okay I, I think that's a that's a fair question um and i i thought for example I mean, as I the, the further I got into this with all the you know the details and how how you have, I mean, there's definitely a purpose for for this thing. It's not you know it's not like it just was kind of randomly happened. Uh, you know, it controls that the right items get into the nucleus and the right items get out of the nucleus. Uh, you know, and um, in a very intricate procedure. Sorry. I was thinking like those things. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because I just can't remember. That's why. And I yeah, thought, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like something about like four, fourth, foresight. You know, like forethought. That there's yeah, well, right, yeah, so, right. You know, uh -huh. able, like I mean, you're going to want to be able to get this this type of molecule through, or maybe even that that metal. You know, that yeah. there had to be a forethought, like a design design a designer would include that forethought that okay this metal is going to go in here that type yeah. of thing that well uh characteristic uh, of a designer like what they're thinking as yeah. they you know like like this like this quote from Campbell and Reese uh uh intricate protein structure called the pore complex lines each pore and plays an important role in the cell it's not just there by accident by regulating the entry and exit of most proteins and RNAs, as well as large complexes of macromolecules. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got a definite, it's got a definite function. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought the, the use of the word architecture in many of these uh, articles was quite mm -hmm. provocative, I think. <clears throat> right. Yeah, no, I... That's true. And then I think that other point that you made about how it can work 24 seven. Right, right. Yes. Well, and, you know, and, and uh, you, you know, and the huge numbers of, of, um, of molecules at a thousand per second out of into and out of each one of each nuclear pore complex, you know, how can that possibly be? Mm -hmm. How can, how could this thing adjust so quickly? It makes me wonder if, in fact, uh, they're more static than they implied, and, and but there are different ones. So with a thousand, you could have, I mean, I mean you could have uh, some that permit smaller molecules and some that per permit larger. They didn't, they haven't said that. They, they imply that, that they're all 
uh, you know, have the capability of expanding or, or, or not expanding. And, you know, but how in the world could they do that so fast? I, I just, I have no clue. Yeah, I was a good Kirby, designer. Yes. Kirby, I was thinking, I was thinking about Belinda's question there. And, um, you know, I think maybe we can say that if, if there's a, if something has a purpose that implies design, right. Um, but then, then you've got the problem of how do you show that it, that it really has a purpose and it's not an accident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but well, a lot of these things are just too intricate and it just, I, you, know, you can't so prove I'm, that it has a purpose. I, I am in no, sure I am in no like way it. suggesting that I am, that this is a proof of common design. I think, you know, I think we need, we, we have to kind of take a, a, a very cautious approach to this and, and, and if, if we have some proof that uh, evolutionary processes are not true or that common descent is not true, then it's, it's fine to present them. But what, what we have, I think, is kind of soft evidence to me. It's, it, it, you know, we're, we're showing design, we're showing purpose, we're showing architecture, we're showing that there's a definite function that is provided. And I think, you know, to say, okay, the purpose is to control the size of the molecules that are going into and out of the nucleus. If you didn't have that, if you didn't have that, that control, uh, there would be chaos. I guess that, that's kind of the other thing is, how about how fast into and out of they, they go? Because you, you probably need to control um, the, in the, you know, how they're coming into and out of the nucleus as well. I, I'm not sure about that one, but I yeah, have so, all kinds of purpose. Yeah, I, I'd imagine. So I guess focusing on the design aspect of things. Yes. I mean, when, when things are designed, there are subparts that have to sort of work together. They, they have to be present at the same time and work great. together to great, affect great whatever whatever. And, um, and in this and in this case, there's a thousand of them, a thousand in each nuclear pore complex of, of okay. proteins. Of proteins, actually, I'm, how I'm, can I'm they, actually how even, can they they work together? How can they yeah. work together? I'm actually even talking about maybe even the structure of a single one of those. Right, it probably contains uh, maybe different proteins and things like well, that. Well, we saw that like the NUP three fifty eight had both zinc, zinc fingers. Yes, and it also had those FG repeats, those right. uh, phenylalanine and glycine repeats, but it also had a couple of dozen other things that it other was things. Doing, you know, and so they're they're doing each one of the proteins is doing special things. Special things. Right. Uh, Kofi, I think as as an engineer, I mean, what are the how how would how would you put that together? Like, you have to have forethought, right? You have to think about uh, to, are the yes. different parts, the different parts. That's, that's, how, that's one of the questions. Doing? That's one of the questions that I was right. going to ask actually, and I, 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 I imagine because I don't have the answer to it. But I'd but, imagine that the structure, but, right? but the structure like, of this, I'd imagine that the structure of these pores um, is ta it's, it takes into account how quickly it needs to regulate the, the passage of things into and out of the of the of the of the nucleus, right? So the 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 the, the, the proteins and the things that make up that those that pore, these have to be very specific, right? They can't be <laughs> right. Absolutely. They have to be specific so that they can they have that sort of ability to work as fast as you pointed out um, that, that they do. Yes, one of the, one of the things that I did not even point out, but is uh, how does it know? How does it know which one is okay to 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 bring into or let go or oh, send let out? Go. And right. yet it has to. It has to it, know which whether it it's has okay to, to, yes. to send it out, yes. you know, or yes. or to let it in. Yes. You know, are, you don't want to send every protein mm -hmm. into the nucleus. Only the ones that are are going to be used for replication uh, or uh, or transcription. Yes. Uh, well, and then if, and as well as uh, to control uh, the process. So, so there's control proteins that have to go in as well. That have to go in as well. Okay. So, so those but, are. But the other thing, excuse me. The other yeah. thing that I was thinking of is, okay, like suppose we're talking about constructing a cathedral 
let's let's talk about cathedrals since I think I see a lot of similarity between the nuclear pores uh, structure and cathedrals. You don't start building the roof before you've started building the the building itself before you started building the foundation. You start at the bottom up. And presumably the nuclear pore complex had to be built kind of the same way. So I, I mean to that to me is another sign of design. There are just so many, so many different signs of design. I probably should have a maybe should have had a special slide which uh which listed all those special features of design. So it's a really good question, Linda. Oh, my face and it. Wait, I just well, unmuted this. Ah. So I was just gonna say, um, Kirk is a scientist and he's working on a linear accelerator. That's a and lot simpler than this biology well, stuff. <laughs> we we did not discuss this, but you know I hear about some of his work problems and how they're trying to uh, adjust cavities and arcing and uh, beam and windows and so on, and um, you know it's it's complicated and they there's a team of them spending a lot of time, a lot of effort on just uh, one aspect of one component. And they, you know, there's hours and hours of meetings about various things and working with vendors and so on. Um, and and yet, in comparison to what you were just telling us about Kirby, it's like um, what he, all all of that complex mechanism, all of the complex mechanisms that Kirk and his team are working on, are it's seem just the, really simple. It's just there and it what works. It's very well, complex, but, but it's just there and it works. Well, mm -hmm. basically, it's either through evolution or through a designer. Right. Yeah. But, but it's just amazing that in comparison, mm -hmm. this very complex linear accelerator seems simple in comparison. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't think a linear accelerator is all that simple myself. But. <laughs> <laughs> How simple than the biology, though? <laughs> In comparison, <laughs> and, and I was thinking, Kirby, I, that this whole thing about you know the the idea of purpose. That's I've got some friends who are theistic evolutionists who they believe evolution, but they believe God is behind it all, and that's the thing that they emphasize that separates them from somebody like Dawkins mm -hmm. is they believe there's a purpose and God has put the purpose into you know into nature, um, and it's driving toward a goal. And uh, somebody like Dawkins, you know, says it's all random and there's no purpose and there's no goal. And right. And um, and he wouldn't be able to say it if all of those things weren't working right. Yeah. But we wouldn't be here if they weren't all working right. Right. Either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, this I, I, I almost when I my jaw dropped when I first saw this. Uh, edition of Ju the June edition of uh, science because it was just so so what I was looking for frankly you know and what what I basically what I generally am looking for is a biological story that demonstrates design and I I thought I found one here yeah Kirby, I think that you you definitely did and um, I think the art the like like anything, we can't prove it, right? We can't right. prove it. But I think you've presented, you know, that abductive um, argument. So we can put all of those different evidences, um, the characteristics of what it, how a designer, you know, designs a mm -hmm. molecule or, you know, a, a system, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you presented here. And those are things that we can connect, I think, with somebody we're having a conversation with who's studying it and to be able right. to counter that idea that it's God of the gaps, you know, that right. with enough time, we're going to be able to figure it out. But if we can actually um, give those characteristics that you pointed out uh, today, um, I, I find that that'll be helpful. So thank you. And then the, other, the, other, the other point I'll make about design is, is optimality, is, is how how well the design works. I think mean, it is possible to start to build, a, you, you want to build a, a cathedral and, and you start with 
when they one of the walls, and then you realize that eh, maybe this I, I need to sort of put a band, you know, band aid on it to make some other maybe the plumbing work, and then okay, so the plumbing is adjusted to the sidewall, and then okay, now I, I take it the foundation. The foundation needs to go in sort of as a band aid to sort of make it work with the plumbing and the sidewall. So you can sort of construct uh, uh, what seems to be a, a complicated structure by very poor, um, <laughs> sort of poor engineering, <laughs> right? And you might get something to function, but in order for it to function optimally, right? All the parts that need, that go into that design have to be, you have to conceive of those at the beginning. They all have, you know, you have to think about all those things and, in you know, proper relationship to all the other parts at the beginning and put this thing together. Um, you, you just, well, <laughs> yeah, you, you just gave me a, an, an idea of another analogy. Yes. Uh, so when we go, we want to go buy a car, we go buy a car. When we want a vacuum cleaner, we buy a vacuum cleaner. Without ever having to think of how does somebody put this together? You know, and, and yet here are all of these organisms. They're already put together. Nobody yes. has to put them together. They're already put together, put together. and they yes. reproduce themselves. Yes. You know, so it's, it's, like, it's like we already have a store full of stuff that's, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to get the fingers and the arms and the toenails and, yes. you know, and, and assemble them. They're we're already there. Yeah. Kirby, yeah. I just... But just thinking in my career as a statistical programmer, the starting point was always specifications. I couldn't do anything unless I had a specification from a statistician. Right. And that's what I designed was based upon specifications. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. looking at the nuclear pore complex, there must have been specifications to design it. And I can't see how a nuclear pore complex could exist or with, I mean, the, uh, the envelope around the nucleus could have existed without the pores. It would have had to have been specified by somebody. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> yeah, those are those words, the specification and the optimization. Those are the words I was thinking about for design. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> so Kirby, we're going to be able to to also have conversations with young engineers too. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, since no one else is asking questions, I, I I had created a couple of questions. We one of the first one we've already <clears throat> answered, but. The second one, and again, I, I don't really have a good answer for it. So you know, maybe you, you all can help me with it. The proteins or NUPs, the nuclear por porins, are made in ribosomes. Okay, the ribosomes are outside the nucleus. So they've got to have mRNA goes outside the, the nucleus and it finds a ribosome. Well, the ribosomes are kind of all over the place in the cytoplasm of the cell. How does it know which ribosome to go to in order to, because presumably you don't want to go to a ribosome that's really far away from the nucleus. You would like to find one that's close to and close to the, to the exact pore that you want it to come in, in, uh, into contact with. Okay, so I can say, well, all right. So there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of ribosomes uh, there. So they just go out. And if they are supposed to go into the nuclear pore complex, they pick a ribosome that's right and close. Okay. How does one that's not going into the nuclear pore complex get chosen? Ah, okay. So each, each nuclear, each, uh, uh, each protein basically, and, and, and each messenger RNA needs to have a pretty good idea. It needs to know exactly where it's needed where the protein is going to be needed. How in the world do they do that? I don't know how they do that, frankly. There, there is an article coming out in Nature. 
from Japan, which is about the tubal structures, which is the internal transport system outside of the nucleus, and the carrier, which grabs things and takes it to the right address. <laughs> uh, that already exists outside. That's your distribution system. And those tubules reconfigure from different starting points to different endpoints. True, true. <laughs> so the, the, we, we have not really touched all of the complexity. Right. And the, the, the fact that uh, some metals are poisons, the metals who are poisons are the ones that are the wrong part of the, the, the sequence of what is supposedly in the same column of, of, of their valence but they don't work right in their, some of those metal proteins if they're not zinc. Well, I, I can think of one very specific one where, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, and that is the, uh, the iron molecule in hemoglobin, actually in heme. I'm, I'm actually working on my next presentation, which is gonna be on the red, red blood cells. But, um, but anyway, iron, uh, is needed for heme, and iron is the is the thing, of course, that carries oxygen into and uh, out of and 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 uh, carbon dioxide back into the lungs. But it's got to have iron. But iron, unfortunately, is also very active, and if you don't have if you don't buffer the iron with with a special enzyme, uh, the iron will cause all sorts of. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, superoxides to form, and uh, it's it basically is as you said, Rodney is toxic. So um, even iron, you know, that is totally essential, has got to be handled in a careful way, or else it's going to be a mess. It's going to cause a problem. So this project is it was enormous. Before you could even be build life, you had to have metals, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that took billions of years to make the parts. <laughs> so the estimate of what the design is about is really dwarfs the imagination. Indeed. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, <clears throat> I don't know if we have any more questions. I mean, if people want to leave, I guess they can, or uh, if they have no more questions. Uh, I have a question, Kirby. Go um, ahead. Is, is there any sequencing about these thousand per second? Do they need to be in a sequence? I have, the same, totally I have the same question, and I don't think they know. I see. I, I think it's a great question myself, but <laughs> well, I was there's a lot of there's there's an awful metal. lot of you'd be surprised in, in some of these articles that are so highfalutin you'd be surprised at how often they even even in these articles they admit well we don't really know this and this this particular feature is uncertain this this feature is uncertain and lots of lots of lacunas in their in their uh, knowledge so um good question well i think this was a very good talk and you put a lot of effort into it well, thank you. And you've revealed some things that we would not have ever looked at on our own. <clears throat> That's kind of what I'm kind of what I'm trying to do is is to is to find things that are of design interest that that you know indicate design and that you people probably would not have looked up on their own. Uh, this the red blood cell may may, may be an exception because you you know, many of you have given blood in the past and you, you're generally aware that you need to have the right blood type if you're gonna get a transfusion and you, you need to, you, you know that you need hemoglobin, lots of hemoglobin, lots and lots of hemoglobin. That's what I'm finding out. <laughs> so I'm, anyway, that's, that's not sure when I'll have that one ready because it's, it's actually what I've put together is I thought kind of short. It's only 10 or 15 minutes long. So <laughs> that's a little too short, I think. <clears throat>
<laughs> 45 minutes may, be a, may have been a little too long for this one, but. Uh, Kirby, is there an information about whether or not these are bi-directional, these uh, thousand per second? Yeah, they're bi bi-directional. <clears throat> Wow, must have a good traffic cop out there. Somewhere. Indeed. <laughs> and so, 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 Kirby, the, the, the bidirectional, but it's 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 proteins coming out, right? And the proteins uh, coming that, in. That, the, the proteins MR, coming in. mRNA, mRNA, and going mRNA out. going out. Proteins, okay. proteins coming now. But the, apparently, other macromolecules as well, and I'm not sure what other macromolecules there are. But anyway, so yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, Sorry. And the sequence, the sequence in which you know, the, the sequence in which the mRNA goes out and the proteins come in, is this, is this sequence, does it have to be, uh, does it have to be uh, an ordered sequence? Does it have to be ordered? You'd think so. You'd, you'd uh, certainly think so, or, or else, you know, it would be a big mess. Okay, okay. You know, I'm, okay. I'm thinking- I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that the protein is built in a very, in the, in the ribosomes, it's built in a very specific yes. um, yeah. order. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. Okay. But I mean, it does, it does remind me of, um, uh, I was a manufacturing engineer. I, was, I said I was an electrical, I was an electrical engineer, but my last uh, nine years, I was a, a manufacturing engineer. We had to make sure that the components, the right component was there at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we didn't always succeed, but these things do. These things do succeed. How do they do it? I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyone else? I think I will I will <clears throat> close this down. I'll I'll uh, I'll let me close with a word of prayer and then uh, I'll, I'll, Karen and I will stick around for if anybody wants to chat further, not necessarily about nuclear pore complexes, but whatever you want to talk about. So let's uh, let's pray. Gracious Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to get together and think about these things and think about what looks to us like it was carefully designed, that you carefully designed it. You reused, <clears throat> you reused designs that were perfectly good. Um, for very, very, very many types of, well, all eukaryotes are, are using the same uh, nuclear pore complexes. It kind of boggles the mind that you would have come up with a, a design that worked for so many of them with enough differences so that you could support the tiniest organism to the largest whale or elephant or even us humans. Thank you so much, Lord. And uh, please go with us now as we continue our lives, and um, we just praise you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.